This is my second time here. I was here about, I think, two years ago, and I remember having, I'm in this room, and I remember having a wonderful conversation, a, a thoughtful conversation, challenging conversation. I liked it a lot. It was good. So I do want to have, as much as we possibly can today, an actual conversation, but I also need to make the point that, you know, today, a lot of what I'm doing, I, I'd like to do in like a, a 90 minute, two hour workshop. This is more of a, a presentation than a workshop. I know that what's going to happen after this is going to have you enact many of the things we're talking about here. Um, uh, but I still want you to be thinking as I'm talking, okay? So what I'd like you to do is just take a moment and write, um, choose a general education course that you've taught or that you're going to teach or that you'd like to teach. I want you to have a particular course in mind. I want you to write it down at the top of your page, okay? You all, you all got notebooks, I know, that came with your little packets. Just put that down at the top of the page. You can have this in mind. We're gonna touch base with this a little bit. We're not gonna do too much sharing, um, maybe not even any, but um, I do want you to have this kind of focusing in your head as, you're, as we're working through this. You know your fields, right? I hate nothing more than being somebody who is perceived as coming in and telling you what to do. You know your fields, I don't. <laughs> and so I want you to enact what I'm talking about within your field. You're the experts there, so that's where we're going with this. Okay. First, a brief little reminder of current trends in general education. I'm not even sure I need to do this because it sounds like you guys have been in this for two years now, but just to kind of put it out there. You know, the way that we used to think about general education is this, is this breadth model. You study a little bit of the sciences, a little bit of the social sciences, a little bit of the arts and humanities, and then you're prepared to go out into the world, right? Um, we've, we've kind of moved beyond that. We've recognized that simply exposing people to different areas doesn't necessarily help them. Okay, this model, you know, was developed 150 years ago when it was uh, a very elite, small and elite group of white men going to university, you know, and, and uh, all they needed to do was be exposed enough to go to their, their cocktail parties and their horse races or whatever and, and have this, uh, but, you know, we're living in the real world now. So, education, to, uh, Gen Ed 2.0 is more of a model that's about connection. Okay, about seeing not just here are the sciences, here are the social sciences, and here are the humanities, but how do these things connect? As Dr. Rye pointed out, what, the, what are the connections between poetry and mathematics? Okay, what are the connections between the scientific method and how you read a Dickens novel? Okay, and there are connections. Beyond that, though, with General Education 2.0, we're not just talking about how these courses connect to one another, and by the way, I want to make the point that, uh, you know, we, the, the term interdisciplinary gets tossed around. I prefer the word integration, because interdisciplinary to me means, seems to say we're going to take two things and we're going to put them together. Integration, in my mind, is more here's something that we're doing and here's how it connects already. We're not forcing a connection. We're taking the connection that already exists and foregrounding that, okay? So not only are we integrating one discipline to another, giving students the opportunity to think about how things connect to one another within the academy. We're thinking about how things connect beyond the academy to the jobs that they're going to have or that they already have, to their majors, to um, their community life, to their personal goals, to their political life, to their life as citizens in a democracy, hopefully, <laughs> um, to their spiritual life. You know, all these things, so it's not just what happens in the classroom, what happens on the campus, but how does it connect to the world and to the lives that they live? Um, and there's a lot of uh, um, research in the last 10 years. Uh, Armin Roxa came up with a book, Academically Adrift, it came out in 2011, that showed for many students, when they go to college, they look at it as certification. Let me go here, I will go to your course, I will do the test, I will turn the paper, you will give me a degree and I will earn more money and that's all I'm really after. Okay, we don't, <laughs> you know, I mean, when, when the school year rolls around and I start prepping every night for nine or ten months, I don't do that so I can certify somebody. I do that because I think the ideas that we're working with here really matter. And I think we're all driven by that, right? So we're trying to figure out not just, what we're looking at here is not just what, what do we teach in our course that matters, but how do we foreground how it matters to students, okay? Um, 
I like to think that this model is so different from the previous model that I don't even want to call it uh, general education anymore. General education implies that everything's general, everything's vague, everything's superficial. Liberal education derives not from uh, liberal as in politically leaning liberal, but liberal as in uh, liberation. Artis liberalis, uh, the arts by which a human being is liberated, the arts by which a human being is free, not trapped in a narrow field. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about how we, we can think a little bit about how that might apply to the, um, uh, the politics of the current age. Reasons for this shift. Um, I like to use the term uh, wicked world. And by wicked, what I mean, I, that's derived from engineering. Uh, years ago, I worked with an engineer named Edmund Coe. He was Stanford educated, taught at Carnegie Mellon. When I met him, he was at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. And he talked about how engineers have these wicked problems, problems that aren't static, that aren't fixed, where the dynamics, the parameters of the situation are shifting constantly. Um, think about when China put a uh, railroad uh, connecting Beijing to Tibet going across Outer Mongolia. So they've got this, this surface, this land that is inconsistent, that freezes, that is extreme, and then it thaws. And so how do you, how do you build railroads and or engineering to, to, with this landscape that's constantly changing? Okay? Think also about the Gulf Horizon uh, explosion back in 2002. 2009, where we didn't know what had happened. We didn't know how it had happened. There's currents going in and out. The weather's changing constantly. Our understanding of the situation is changing constantly. So there's incomplete data. It's a little bit like changing a, the tire on a bicycle as you're riding the bicycle. <laughs> okay? um, and the world, really, if you think about it, is full of wicked problems. The Zika virus. Zika's been around for 30 years. We knew it was there. We didn't know it was going to operate in these ways. And now we don't know what it really means. How much of a problem is it going to be in the United States? Is a pregnant woman at risk or not? Um, what do you do if, the pregnant, if a woman is pregnant and has Zika virus? How do we prevent it? How is it transmitted? We don't know these things. We're trying to figure it out as we go along. Um, FBI versus the iPhone. Again, about a year and a half ago, the San Bernardino uh, situation, where the FBI was trying to get into the iPhone. And for them, that iPhone was a wicked problem, right? And for the rest of us, the question of, do we want the FBI to get into our phones? That's a wicked problem, right? I mean, how do we handle these situations of, of fear and terrorism versus civil liberties and freedom and democracy? Um, ISIS. We're at war with or in combat with a nation state that's neither a nation nor a state that doesn't have a set capital, doesn't have a set hierarchy. Um, fake news. In fact, uh, you could probably say the whole 2016 election was a wicked problem, right? We have never seen a candidate like Donald Trump. We, the survey models, none of them worked, right? And now, and then the news, this thing that we didn't even realize was happening, what is true and what isn't true? Um, how do we know what's true and what isn't true? Now that uh, Trump is actually in office, boy, I'll tell you what, um, reporters don't know he's a wicked problem for them. They don't know how to handle him or how to respond to him. And for Frankly, some people in Congress don't know how to handle them or how to respond to them as well. Um, so, and that's not, a, that's not saying that Trump is a problem necessarily. I'm just saying that it's complicated, right? So, um, other reasons for this shift is a wicked workplace, you know, where there are new, mar new markets, new clientele. Nobody saw, you know, uh, 10 years ago, nobody knew that Myanmar was going to uh, open up. Nobody knows uh, what do we do when we're, we're dealing with a new global client, okay? Um, Fifteen years ago, Hong Kong really mattered and China didn't so much. Now China matters a lot and Hong Kong doesn't so much. So what does that mean in terms of the kinds of work we're doing, in terms of how we communicate with these different clients, in terms of the needs? Um, new challenges. You know, technology is changing so rapidly. Um, hiring protocols are changing so rapidly. Um, the tools we use, how we know which tools we're going to use, how we, what problems those new tools create, what technologies we use to solve the new problems, you know? That's, those are all wicked problems. Um, and if you, don't, if you don't think technology is a new problem, I'm going to get, or is, is a wicked problem, you don't have a teenager. <laughs> okay. I, you know, my daughter's like, can I use this app? I don't even know what that app is. <laughs> you know, and so, and I can find out what it is over here, but I can't really, you know, Snapchat, I don't know. <laughs> um, my answer is just generally for my daughter, no. <laughs> um, new regulations. I have a, a friend who works in um, IPOs, and she says every time they want to release a new company and put it out there on the market, uh, the SEC comes forward and says, guess what, the rules have changed. 
Okay, so we're moving, it's constantly changing, constantly shifting. Um, and think about this too, career paths are a wicked problem. You know, a person's 22 or you know, maybe 25 or 26 when they graduate college, do they really know what they want to do? And if they get into a career, how do they know if it's the right career for them? And then if they shift to a completely different field than the one we anticipated, you can kind of look at, um, and anytime I like to, when I'm on a plane, I'll sort of ask the people sitting next to me, what did you study, what do you do? And half the time, what they studied and what they do is exactly the same, and half the time it's completely different. I studied engineering, and now I'm a lawyer. You know? um, so the career paths, finding our ways through life, that's a wicked problem. Education is a wicked problem. Who are the students we have in our classes? What are their needs? What techniques, what technologies, um, what motivations are going to work for them? Okay, so we're living in a wicked world. And the idea behind this move towards uh, new general education, um, an integrative general education, is it's not enough to simply say, here's science, here's the humanities, here's the social sciences. Now go out there and solve these complex problems that draw from all three of them. What we need to do is say, here are the sciences, here are how they're connected. Here are the social sciences, and here's how they're connected and not connected. Here are the humanities. Here's how they're connected and not connected. And get students used to moving from one area to another area to another area and constantly having to adapt their thinking. Now, if we don't teach this explicitly, what happens is our best students go out and they're powerful and they're good and they're fine. But those B students and those C students and those D students, we have an obligation to them as well. And we want to make sure that they can move into the world and see these wicked problems and respond to them in thoughtful, deliberate ways, that they're empowered in those ways, right? Okay, so that's kind of where we're coming from, where I'm coming from at least, in terms of general education and the path we're taking. So, implications of this for our courses. Well, <laughs> here's how it generally works in a major. I teach the 100 level course to prepare them for the 200 level course, which prepares them for the 300 level course. Okay, nice logic, linear logical model. General education, a little trickier. <laughs> I'm teaching a course in, say, artistic responses to science and technology. Um, it's a humanities course. I am trying to connect it with other GE courses. That's why I've got art and science in the same course. I'm very comfortable with that. That fits my background. Um, doesn't fit every other English professor's background, but if it's mine, fine. So I use it. Um, other major courses. I like, I believe in poetry. It drove me, got me through college, <laughs> you know. Um, I believe poetry really matters. I know that on my campus there are a bunch of mathematician students and biology students who don't see any sense or value to it at all. I want them in my class because I want them to engage this and I want to work with them. And I learn a lot from them when they're in my class, by the way. Um, home life. Citizenship. Again, 2016 election. Popular culture, how does all this connect? There, I mean, students spend so much time getting all these things sort of, you know, Netflix, watch, washing over them, washing over them. Well, if we're not getting them to think about, th about that critically, what are the consequences of that? Um, media, social life, you know, and wicked problems in the world. So the point of a gen ed course is not prepare you for here and then here, but to say, here's where we are, here's why this matters. To the, uh, to the world around us, to the other things going on in your academic life, to the other things going on in your life. The implications of this for assignment design, well, traditional college paper, and I want to be really clear here, one, I'm going to vastly generalize, okay? So I'm putting that out there right away, I understand that I'm doing it. Two, I want to be really, really clear that I'm not ripping on traditional academic papers. They have a place, and they have a value, and they have a purpose, especially for students who are further along in their majors. When a student is further along in their major and they're really entering that discourse community, a traditional approach to an academic paper makes perfect sense. Okay, so I just want to make sure that that's out there. Okay. So the traditional college paper, traditional academic paper, will have, yeah, something like this. Uh, the implicit audience, sometimes explicit audience, is a professor. You're writing to me. I'm your professor. Write to me. Um, and that has all kinds of implications for language. Sometimes you get this. Sometimes you get students who write very clearly. Other times you get students where you're thinking, 
you know that you're writing to a professor, don't you? <laughs> and they're using the biggest words and the longest sentences they possibly can. Okay. Um, so, but it's from the field to the field. It's within a closed circuit. Um, it's intended largely, not completely, but largely to show me that you paid attention in class. Show me you know what you're talking about. Okay, show me you understand the concepts in class. And that has some implications too. On some level, that's a little bit of, um, I know a lot about this, you've been in here now, show me you know the same thing. And they can kind of lean on us a little bit there. Um, I, I uh, had a professor once in, um, when I was in uh, undergraduate and I had an exam in Russian and he asked me a question and I knew I knew it but I just couldn't. I just couldn't, it was an oral exam and I just couldn't get it, couldn't get it, couldn't get it. So he nudged me and nudged me and, and I could lean on him, okay? And sometimes in some circumstances when they're writing a paper or doing some sort of project, they know they can lean on us. They might not get the concept perfectly, but they know we know it, okay, hopefully. <laughs> um, and then oftentimes these, these assignments are generic. Um, that is, they're not course or institution or uh, curriculum specific. Um, and that's important because um, uh, among other things, you know your population at Montgomery College. It's a very specific population. It's different than the population of Roanoke College, which is different than the population of Virginia Tech. And we should be creating assignments for the population we're working for, for their needs and for our institutional mission. Okay. And by the way, generic papers, and I'm thinking about something like the 20-page the research paper, you know, research a topic that you find interesting and add your voice to the conversation. You can download that. You don't even have to pay for it. You can find it really easily, so. Okay, let me do this visually. Many academic assignments, here's basically what they look like. This is um, Aristotle's rhetorical triangle. It has basically three components. The writer, the speaker, the audience, and the topic. Um, and I'm pretty sure I might have covered this, I can't remember if I covered this two years ago or not, but let me just kind of refresh you. Writer, speaker, audience, topic. Change any one of these three, everything else changes. So a student goes to a party, so student is a writer, speaker, party is a topic, and the next day sends an email or a text to their high school friend, right? It's going to be one kind of text or email. Change that audience not to high school friend but to grandma, <laughs> and everything's different, <laughs> right? How they, how they talk about the party, what they mention or don't mention, the words they use to refer to the party, how they construct themselves. I was a designated driver, grandmother. I was very responsible, <laughs> you know? Um, change the, the topic to the email of to grandma. Now it, you're not writing about the party, but you're writing about church. Or change the topic that you're writing to the high school friend. It's not about um, the party, but about an exam that you took. You change the topic, everything else changes too. Okay? So you change one, everything changes. Point being, we can manipulate this. Here's traditionally how academic papers work. The topic is a, a, a subject that's been discussed by experts in the field. The audience is a professor with unlimited expertise and a great book. <laughs> how, how cool is that for the student? Um, and then the student is someone who's been in the class for 13 weeks. All right? So, in all practical purposes, what this really looks like is this. All right? The student's at the bottom, there's a topic up there, and there's a professor sitting there with a grade book and the red pen going, come on. <laughs> Good luck. Um, my friend Nancy Welch says this is, uh, you might as well put a handle on it. It looks that much like a dagger, right? <laughs> so, um, so, the point being that there's, the, the, the student's not really in a situation where a, a couple of things happen. One, they're being asked to do something that's artificial. It isn't really true. Be an expert? No. I've been teaching for 21 years. I've had a PhD since 1996. I, the student and I can't communicate on the same level. That's artifice. Okay? This is what it's really like. Um, two, they don't have to really assume, because I'm the expert in the field, they don't really have to be the expert in the field. Okay? They can sort of rely on me. They can gloss over terms a little bit. They can not define concepts very carefully. Um, but sometimes when they bring in an outside resource, maybe they don't introduce that resource or introduce that, um, the, the topic very carefully. They don't have to because they know they've got me on their side, you know, or helping them along, or that the real responsibility is with me. The real knowledge is with me, not with them. So it lets them off the hook a little bit in the same time that it puts a lot of pressure on them. What I want to think about a little bit today is ways to reconfigure this so that it looks more like this. Where the topic is still there, the student is still in charge, 
but they're more in charge. The audience, rather than being above the student or on par with the student, is slightly below the student in terms of their knowledge about whatever they're writing about or whatever they're doing an oral presentation about or making a film about or making an academic poster about. Okay? What this does is it shifts responsibility from the professor to the student. The student has to own the information. The student has to know it better than this audience. They're responsible for making sure it's clear. Um, let me give you a little bit of a metaphor for this. Um, when I was in graduate school, uh, in order to take my, uh, or do my PhD, my qualifying exams were three weekend long exams. I picked them up Friday morning at 8 a.m. and I dropped them off Monday at 4 o'clock. I did that three times. Yeah, <laughs> completely exhausting. You would think after those three weekend long exams, I was a master of that content. I knew it and I knew I knew it and I was good. I never knew my content so much as the first day I had to walk into a room and explain Victorian literature to a student. That moment where we have to teach someone else, that's where we own it, right? I'm seeing a lot of nodding heads. We've all pretty much had that experience. That's the moment where it goes, okay, okay, let me make sense out of this. So that's what we're talking about here, is putting the students in that situation where they have to assume authority. Okay. so. Um, I'm going to use Jane Danielowitz and Jordan Jack. Uh, Jane Danielowitz is at UNC Chapel Hill. Jordan Jack is now at Penn State. Uh, she used to be at Chapel Hill as well. They kind of lay out and say, listen, we've got, we're oversimplifying this, this issue of how to deal with academic audiences. There are other options we have here. They lay out three. The first one is insider to insider, which is basically written by someone who is an insider, knowledgeable on the topic, to someone else who's knowledgeable on the topic. Well, I'm going to say again, that's perfectly legit for advanced courses in the major. Makes perfect sense. But I'm going to cross it off here. Okay? When we've got a kid who's taking their first class in biology, or their first class in computer science, or their first class in literature, that doesn't make any sense. All right? The two I do want to work with are insider to non-specialist and insider to public, also known as insider to general public. Um, First, let me give an example of insider and non-specialist. What we're talking about with non-specialists is somebody where they have some sort of interest in the topic that you're talking about. Maybe it's a professional connection on some level, but they are not themselves perfectly experts. Um, my uh, colleague Gail Steeler, who's a chemist, would tell her chemistry students, um, don't write this paper to me. Write this paper to your English professor. They're interested in the topic, but they don't know chemistry, okay? Um, so let me give you a couple examples. Uh, for a, a, a course on biology, here's a prompt that you give the student. You, meaning the student, are on an environmental policy board that is looking at uh, land reclamation in Victoria Harbor, um, basically filling the harbor in with soil to build more buildings. Um, your job as a biologist on this committee is to uh, make a recommendation with regards to the impact on marine life. What potential hazards do you see? How might you explain these ha hazards in a carefully researched way? Now, I want to make a couple points about this. They're on a board. They're, the entire board is looking at land reclamation. Different people on the board, they're all interested in that topic, but some of them bring different skills. Some have an economic perspective. Some have a political perspective. Some have a sociological perspective. You, the student, you're the marine biologist. You are the expert in marine biology. So that's what you're talking about. That's the first point I want to make, right? Second point I want to make is that um, though this is kind of a little bit of a different assignment, right? They're, they're writing to a sort of different audience. It's still like a research paper, <laughs> they're still doing research. They're just doing it for a slightly different purpose. Okay? And we can, I, I didn't really talk about this, but we can go on, I can, we can talk about sort of the traditional research paper. There's lots of problems with that, one of which is at the data dump where they simply get, they skim, and they, they will say this to you. I skimmed, I, got a, I, found, I found five good articles, I skimmed for good quotes, and then they threw the quotes in the paper, and you get nothing but their quotes. You know, you don't get any of their own ideas. That, that's really problematic. Well, here they're researching, but they have to actually own the research and explain the research to somebody else who's not going to get it. Let me give you another example. From my general education course in sociology, your major, so the kid's taking a sociology course. They're not sociologists. They're English majors, they're biology majors, they're mathematics majors, they're political science majors. Your major, the, the student, your major department is revising its curriculum. 
Because you've been in my sociology class and you know sociology is everywhere. <laughs> it affects everything. Any sociologists in the room? Okay, sociology is everywhere but in this room. <laughs> okay. Um, sociology is everywhere. It does affect everything. You need to make a, a proposal that explains to your biology professor why you need a sociology class in biology, in the biology curriculum. Okay? And I like a couple things about this. And you've got a cite in order to do that. It isn't just your opinion. You're citing particular theorems and particular ideas. You're taking the things we've talked about in the class, the content in the class, and you're taking it outside of that class and making connections to other areas. Okay? Um, I, I like a couple things about this. Thing, I, one thing I like about this is I don't care if the student likes sociology or not. You know? I think it's a good experience for a student to have to adopt a perspective that they might not agree with and to think through that logic that they might not agree with. I think that's a very important skill, particularly today in the political situation that we're in. Um, the other thing I'm going to say about this, you can use this for any major. You can do this for poetry, you can do it for biology, you can do it for political science. It's a great mental exercise for a student. What did you learn in this course that matters and why does it matter? That why is crucial. So much we focus, they come to class thinking they're going to get what. We want to give them why. Okay. Another example, uh, I like this one, it's from Wesley College. First year seminar, a course designed on art uh, and community mur murals. Create a proposal for a, land, a local public mural for possible grant funding applications, include a description of the project, several means of creating community input involvement, and the long-term goals for community impact and a budget. Okay. So yes, we're studying art here, but we're thinking about how art works in the world. And by the way, in order to do that, you need to know a little bit about politics. You need to know a little bit about sociology. You need to, oh my god, know something about mathematics. <laughs> okay. So it's connecting to other fields, and it's giving more purpose to what it is that they're doing. This is a first year seminar. I love this project. Okay. So please note, um, each of these, uh, the content is the same. We're not changing the content. We're not lightening the content. It's there, it's intense, and it matters. So whatever you do, you should have a high standard for students. I'm not teaching sociology light or literature light. I'm teaching real reading, real analysis. I want you to take Victorian literature and justify why people should care about it today by analyzing a novel by Dickens. Okay. Same skills, same content, high expectations. Um, just a different audience with a different purpose. If we're going to make these changes, we need to alert, alert students to this fact. Every once in a while you have a, an assignment where you say, here's what I want you to do, and they're like, ooh, this is fun, this is different, and they just kind of improvise it, and you're like, no, 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 no. It is fun, it is interesting, but I really want you to be doing the logic, really want you to be doing the thinking. So that's important. All right. General public, insider to public, written to a more general audience with varying levels of knowledge and education. So basically, anybody, and they don't know anything about the topic. Okay? So it's probably going to be slightly less formal here. Um, think about like Newsweek magazine, which is written for, actually I'm not even sure Newsweek still exists, Time magazine, which is written for never above a 12-year-old language. Okay, so I'm not saying you have to go that low, but this is the kind of thing we're talking about. Let me give you a couple examples. A gen ed course in biology by Kathleen Curran, uh, again at Wesley College, on emerging infectious diseases. Create a pamphlet for the PTO parents, the parent-teacher organization parents, about an infectious disease that they should worry about. Include causative agent and vector, threat to local population, and, popular, uh, and, and possible measures to reduce risk. Okay, a couple points I want to make. Very broad audience, parents, very invested audience. It matters writing to this audience. This audience really cares. Um, but the, um, nothing is dummy down. You're still using real science in order to do this. Okay, but you have to translate that real science into language that this audience can understand. That translation exercise, Cognitively, what's happening in the brain is really processing and owning the information in ways it wouldn't otherwise. Okay? So the student's going to master that information more thoroughly than they would simply regurgitating it to us. Another example, ah, yeah, this one in mathematics. This is from Patrick Balls. I mentioned um, him to um, Sharon 
earlier. He's somebody you guys might, might want to think about bringing in. He's at UNC Asheville. He works a lot with mathematics and general education, mathematics and writing. Um, so what he does in his courses is he says, in addition to having students solve problems in mathematics, have them also, as the semester goes along, create a textbook on how to solve problems for next year's students or high school students or remedial students. Okay? So again, they have to own that information, own those ideas, master it in order to explain it to somebody else. All right? I like that one a lot. Uh, Jen Ed Corson in, in History, Foundations of Western Civilizations. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. I always have this one in here. It's not political commentary, but it could be. Um, <laughs> you are running for Congress. In addition, to, uh, in an address to your potential constituents, you've had this course in Foundations of Western Civilization. Explain the political, religious, economic, or social problems of Rome, how they might inform policy in the American context today. Okay, so taking something from the past and relating it to the present. I like this assignment because it gives students options. They can do politics, they can do religion, whatever really fits their field and their interests. Okay. But again, it's that act of translating. In order to do that translation, you need to know the idea from the inside out. All right. But, you know, we've been talking about papers so far. I come from a composition and rhetoric background, so that kind of makes sense. But what about uh, oral presentations? Years ago, I was in a workshop, and I was talking about these things, and suddenly from the back of the room, this woman goes, oh my god! And we all turned around thinking she'd spilled her coffee or had a heart attack or something. And what had happened is she just... She said, we all looked at her and she said, I teach gender, developmental gender politics. I have my students do oral presentations. Every time they do their oral presentations, they always present to each other. And so they're presenting on topics that everybody else in the room knows about. And it's this fake thing where they're bored and the person's trying to be interesting and it's conveyance of information that doesn't need to be conveyed in any way, shape, or form. She goes, from now on, what I'm going to have them do, I'm going to change the requirement. We're still going to do the presentations in class, but they need to pretend or assume that the people in the audience are not college students, but 12-year-old boys <laughs> who are about to become men. <laughs> and so this really matters. And everyone in the room went, oh my god. <laughs> so it's a great example just by changing who. Yeah. And you know what? She could actually take that into the schools. That would be amazing. But you don't have to do that. You, know? you can have it you know, be a, a rhetorical exercise, but it has more meaning than the actual reality. That's intriguing. Posters. Um, one of the courses I teach is um, composition and rhetoric, which is basically teaching people how to teach writing. And um, the way that I used to do that course is at the end of the semester, I'd say pick a population that has literacy needs, design a curriculum for them, give me a rationale for that, that curriculum. And, you know, the good students would do pretty well with it. And, you know, some of the not so good students would do fairly well with it. And it'd be fine. It was fine. It was good. It made sense, right? Then what I decided I was going to do is I was going to have them actually, instead of doing the curriculum individually, I was going to put them in a group, pick a population again, and then make a poster, three by four foot poster, you know, those science sized posters, and then present these posters in the commons over the lunch hour so that their classmates are walking by, so that other professors are walking by. You know, we're at a small college, the college president walks by and comes and talks. And I, I mean, a, a couple things I saw right away, and I do this all the time now, a couple things I saw right away was one, just the light in their eyes changed. Knowing they were going to have a real audience, they just became focused. And the, you know, the class would break up and they'd cluster into groups right away, planning what they were going to do next, what they were going to do next. I noticed that the rationales, which were individually written, so group project and then an individual rationale to make sure everybody's participating, the individual rationales were more interesting to read. They had more energy, more focus. Okay, so everything changed. Um, but, you know, one of, the, one of the times I did this, I had a, a colleague in, in a computer science show up. And there was a group that had done digital literacy as kind of their major tool, their technology tool. And so um, Anil sort of stepped up and sort of started looking at what they were doing and started questioning them. And he's this, 
he's intense. I mean, he's known on campus as being one of those tough, 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 demanding professors, right? And so he's questioning them, and then he's questioning them, and then he's questioning them, and I'm, I'm standing back going, oh my God, they're going to they're gonna hate me. <laughs> you know, I'm, I've destroyed their lives. So afterwards, when they were done, because he was just grilling them, right? And they're standing, I mean, they're, you know, they're in their suits, and they're just, they're at full, you can just tell from their body posture, they're, they're focused here. And afterwards I said, I'm, so was that okay? And they said it was excellent. He really cared. He really cared about what we were saying. And, and again, it's strange to us because we care so much about what we do, but what a lot of the data shows is that students think that we're just doing this and they're just doing this because it's what we have to do. It's this meaningless dance that we have. When in reality, we want it to be meaningful. We want them to know we care and we want them to focus like they care. Because that's, when a person cares, we know this, this isn't just a humanist speaking, this is biology, the science of the brain. We know that when emotions are engaged, the brain remembers more effectively, okay? Um, quantitative projects, there's nothing that says that a quantitative project has to be performed just for mathematicians. It makes a lot more sense to take it out of the world. Math is used, we use it for purposes. Um, exam questions, why is an exam question always written it to me? You know, okay, you're in my class, what have you learned in this class that matters? Tell me about something that's important in this class. Explain it to your mom, who by the way is paying the bills for you coming here, <laughs> okay? Um, so, or we could even go a little bit further. Um, what about blogs? You know, it used to be that blogs were these dumb things that were kind of written in jargon for a general audience. Well, now you get more and more expert blogs. Um, and if you want an interesting experience, have a student write a blog post and then have somebody in the real world comment on their blog post and suddenly it becomes very real. Um, a drama. Uh, John Bean tells a narrative about um, uh, giving students three options for an assignment. He said, one, you can write a traditional paper. Two, you can write an op-ed for a newspaper, or three, you can create a play that takes the concepts we're working with and puts them into action, okay? Um, what he found is that the people who wrote the traditional paper spent about four hours and had moderate engagement with it. The people who wrote the op-ed had higher engagement but spent about an hour. <laughs> the people who wrote the play spent like eight or 10 hours and had very high engagement. So high engagement, in fact, that they wanted to take it back to their own campuses and perform it. Point being, we can manipulate the way students are thinking about and feeling about engaging with the work that we're doing just by changing audience and by changing genre a little bit. Um, graphic novels. Uh, we know that if you can take a, an abstract concept or a complex concept and create a visual image that represents that concept, it helps student learn and remember that concept. Okay, again, that's biology, not just opinion. So why not have them play out these concepts in a graphic form? Doesn't mean you have to, you know, you, you, I think you probably want to level the playing field by saying, okay, I don't want, you don't get extra points for being a great artist. You know, no one's allowed to do anything other than stick figures, but act these ideas out, okay? Um, short films, here's an assignment I use. I've got a first year seminar I teach on, um, on travel literature. So after spending a semester working with travel literature, I have my students, um, create a three to seven minute YouTube video for students who are about to go to bro abroad, okay? Um, telling them, giving them tips on how to have a successful year. And I say to them, listen, these tips had better be more than, you know, you know, pack a power cord for your phone because you've been in my class for 13 weeks and you're some level of expertise and I expect to see that expertise enacted. Um, so it has to have the complexity of thought. Uh, it's, it's actually, I have them do research for this as well, so it's got to have a bibliography on the film. Uh, and I say, you know, since you're writing it for a student audience, you better be thinking about that student audience. And if you create a film that looks like blah, 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 you're going to not get a good grade in the class because that's not going to appeal the audience. How does humor come into play here? How does music come into play here? And what's interesting about that is when we talk about translating something from traditional thought, traditional logic into humor, there's a processing that goes on there. When we talk about finding music that represents effectively what it is we're trying to say, there's a processing that's going on there. And it's engaging multiple senses and it's going to deepen the learning, okay? In addition, so they do that as a group. Individually, then, I have them write a rationale. You can see I, I do this a lot. Group project, individual rationale, which means groups working together, sharing ideas, or learning from each other, and by the way, collaboration is a crucial skill. 
Um, but then individually, they all have to be responsible. I mean, I like having that opportunity to look and go, well, you must have floated along with your group, didn't you? <laughs> um, each of the tips, and again, it's got a bibliography. So it's a research project. It's just enacted in film form, which engages them more fully. And I don't know about any of you, but this is one of those situations, too, where I thought, oh, man, I'm going to have them make this film. They're going to need to know how to use the software. So I brought an uh, IT uh, guy into my classroom. I said, you have an hour. Can you explain it to them? He goes, oh, yeah, I can explain it to them. 20 minutes into it, into his presentation, one of my students, who's a poet, and I mean that in all the ways that we think of poets. She embraced her poetry in it. She didn't wear shoes. Um, <laughs> she, 20 minutes into it, she turns her laptop around and goes, look, I made a movie. <laughs> and I turned to Mark, I said, you're done here. <laughs> you know, they get it, they know how to do this. Half the time when I put them in the group, not half the time, when I put them in the group, I say, um, they're in their groups, I ask for a raise of hands, who's actually made a film before? There's always somebody, and oftentimes three people in each group that have already made the movies. They've done this. Thank you all. This has been a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much.